Welcome to the VO School podcast, dedicated to the art, craft, and business of voiceover. Each week builds upon the last to give you a comprehensive understanding of a career in VO. My name's Jamie Moffitt. I'm a full-time voice talent and audio engineer, and I'll be joined by some of the industry's top professionals on both sides of the microphone to drill down and dig up the truth. Okay, hello, this is episode four. Thank you to everyone that's listened so far. It's been very encouraging. I've been slightly blown away by the amount of people that have listened in and have commented and have sent me messages and things. So thank you to everyone. It seems like people are getting something out of it, which is which is great. That's uh, a real reason why I'm doing this. So um, thank you. A couple of quick notes before we get into things. You can follow us on Twitter at VO School Pro, and I set up a Facebook group. And the address for that is facebook.com slash groups slash VO School Podcast. Or you can search VO School Podcast in the search bar at the top, and I'm sure you'll find it. Um, I'd like the Facebook group to ultimately be a discussion, like a water cooler kind of discussion, um, that happens post podcast and we can explore ideas that we don't have time to get to in the podcast or different opinions different experiences because of course we can't cover every single angle this episode is most probably not as controversial as last episode Uh, so i tried to rein things in because there are three engineers talking in this episode and we could really easily have gone off on one about really niche subjects so i tried to rein things in a bit having said that there may be things that you hear that you're not quite sure what we're talking about and um you may not have heard certain terms so then i would get on the googles and and do a little search and uh find out things and then maybe re-listen to the episode once you've picked up on the things that you didn't understand the first time around and that's a great way of learning so i'm going to stop babbling on here and we'll get on with the interview after a quick word from our sponsor style power you're watching the home of the nfl the all-new iphone reserve your disney world season pass now through all the runny noses three in the morning coughs an all-new american crime story tonight on fx Hi, it's J. Michael Collins, and these are just a few examples of the first-class demos my team and I are producing. If you'd like to have something similar, visit jmcvoiceover.com and click on the Demo Production tab to find out more. Amanda Rose Smith is a 10-year audio industry veteran with notable projects in the audiobook, gaming, film, and television fields. After earning a master's degree in music technology from NYU, she spent time working as a live sound engineer before turning to studio work. She served as ADR engineer for hit shows such as Orange is the New Black and The Good Wife, and recorded and edited dialogue on games such as Telltale's The Walking Dead. She has directed voice performances for animation and also recorded, edited, and directed over 700 audiobooks. In addition to continuing this work, she currently coaches voice actors in the SAG AFTRA voiceover lab. Tim Tippetts is a voiceover talent and audio tech consultant who helps talent ranging from beginners to the industry's top professionals. His resume includes commercial voiceover work for Mercedes Benz, New Balance, Craftsman, Toyota, JBL, and many more. He is a composer and session player who writes, performs, and mixes for film and commercial beds. Tim also has extensive construction and R&D experience as a tradesman and corporate executive, and is a respected authority on design and construction of professional studios and booths. Here's our interview with Amanda Rose Smith and Tim Tibbetts. So this is Tech 101. That's what I'm calling this episode. And we have Amanda. You are familiar with her from episode one of this series. And we have Tim. Hello, both of you. Hey. Hello. We are covering a fair amount in this episode, I hope. 
but we aren't going to be able to cover every little nuance of audio technology in this this one little episode so you're not planning a 20 hour podcast episode because we would need like five of those probably frankly i'd be fine with that but i think probably (laughs) the listeners wouldn't (laughs) that that can be uh that can be 105 (laughs) yeah exactly yeah this is more a jumping off point um the other thing to consider is that this isn't a visual medium so uh, a lot of this stuff you're going to have to imagine and then Uh, look up afterwards to find out what we're talking about oh you don't want to imagine me in my booth right now (laughs) oh okay no well not visually us specifically (laughs) i mean now i kind of am (laughs) sorry about that no no i look fine i'm i'm dressing you in my mind (laughs) (laughs) Um, Uh, the other thing is that uh it's a given we're talking to people who have gone through the process of wanting to become a voice actor they've investigated it they're they're specking up some some equipment and they're ready to invest a little bit of money in it so you know it's a given that we're at that point so um let's jump straight in so if someone is starting out in this industry and they're wanting to set up their home studio or a home studio for the first time what is the first major consideration your space Mm. yeah I have to agree with that. You have to have a a quiet space to voice in and uh, you can find them in the most surprising places. Uh, A quiet closet in your home is a great way Mm. to start out. Totally. And and clothes absorb sound. So, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you can even throw some, uh, you know, some treatment uh, like a moving blanket on the door of the closet. Definitely. And uh, if you got some carpet in there, you know, Mm -hmm. you're good to go. In fact... I can tell you for a fact that we've heard a lot of promos uh, and and other pieces, commercial pieces on television that have come from a closet. Absolutely. I know people who've done hundreds of audiobooks in their closet. And, you know, for those, you got to sit there for quite a while. But, you know, it doesn't necessarily take a super pro looking space, you know, to make a pretty pro sounding product. Secondary to that is equipment. And I think Mm -hmm. it's important uh, to throw this out here early to anyone um, who is starting their voiceover career to understand that it's really easy to get overly involved in the type of equipment that you need, the software that you need, because there's so much information out there, especially on you know uh, destinations like YouTube mm. and forums where everyone is an expert. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and that's fine. You know, I'm not saying that some of them aren't experts. There are plenty of them out there. I'll say that. But yeah, but it, <laughs> it, I mean, it only takes tripping over one thread to get the wrong idea. And then someone says, Hey, you know, get a Neumann, uh, you 87. <laughs> and then you go out and spend three or $4,000 and, uh, the equipment that you have doesn't support that mic. Yeah. Uh, and we see this all the time on when they do mic shootouts between, you know, and it's all the clickbait, right? A mm-hmm. uh, hundred dollar mic against a Neumann U87. Whoa. And then the conclusion is it sounds just as good, but you're also uploading to YouTube. So we're not getting all of the yeah. sonic information, and, number one. And the space also makes a big difference, you know, because especially yeah. if you're recording in a space that isn't ideal, I tell people, I'm like, yeah, you could get a U87, but it's kind of like... If you go to a supermarket and stand under a fluorescent light and wear no makeup and then take a nice close up picture with a great HD camera. Yeah. Are you going to be true. happy with that? Probably exactly. yeah. not. Right. <laughs> so. yeah. 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 Really well put. And that and that, you know, so these trappings that that new people get into, there's just so much information out there. The, the secret is there is no secret. Right. Just keep it simple. Mm-hmm. You don't need to spend thousands of dollars to get into this game, no. nor should you. I mean, as you as you continue to succeed and you're building your voiceover career, should you improve your entire audio chain? Absolutely. But when you're starting out, you're not going to be voicing for Lexus. No. You're not going to be voicing mm. for, you know, and, and so uh, spend appropriately. You know, a few hundred dollars will get you started. Get yourself sure. in a closet. And besides, anyone who's getting into the game uh, unless you're already a pro, you've got some room to improve, and that takes coaching uh, oh, absolutely. from voiceover coaches before you're even ready to hit the ground running anyway. Yeah. Um, although I would say there are some minimum things which I think will get people off the ground mm-hmm. um, more quickly. What, you know, If you've ever seen me write on the internet, one of the things you'll <laughs> see me see a lot is that, uh, see me say a lot, is that I don't like USB mics. 
Mm, right. I don't think the quality ceiling um, is worth the low cost. Mm. Um, so even though they often seem cheaper initially, I would usually tell people it's a better idea to get an inexpensive mic and pair it with an inexpensive interface. Mm. Um, I think that the sound, your ability to make a better sounding project uh, product is better. And also it allows you to upgrade in a modular way. So for instance, yeah. you can upgrade your mic a little bit later and then maybe get a new interface a little bit later as opposed to having to have this all-in-one product that's not giving you what you want. Right. Now that's, and, and I'm not challenging you on that, Amanda. I agree oh, sure, with you yeah. 100%, but I just wanted to add to that. Um, so I use the Apogee mic uh, for, you know, emergency situations. Mm -hmm. It is a USB mic. Like travel, the diaphragm, right? Yeah, yeah, for travel. But, you know, typically if I'm going to be out of town, I take my Apollo and I take my 416 and, mm -hmm. you know, I go at it. But um, the, the USB mics for long term are just not a good idea. But I've had plenty of students who start out using something like an Apogee mic because, as you both know, probably, they, they hold their value very well. So if you spend $200 on it uh, and things don't work out in your voiceover career, then you can sell it for, you know, 150 That's true. Right? And I would actually point, I love Apogee just as a brand. Like, I yeah. use their Duet interface. I think it's great. I've, I've used plenty of their other products. And I almost look at them, in a way, as kind of an exception mm. um, mm -hmm. to the USB rule a little bit. But... Just case in point, for that same amount of money, you can also go out and get, say, an AT2020 non-USB and uh, a Focusrite Scarlet 2i2. Mm. And it's the same amount of money, but now you have the ability down the line to, say, keep your interface, but get a better mic or, you know, switch out stuff like that. Yeah, agreed. Um, yeah. But I actually really like the way the Apogee mic sounds. It's one, anytime I tell people when I'm like, oh, USB mics, um, in yeah. my mind, I'm like, except the Apogee, it's pretty yeah, good. Yeah, I do, I do the same thing. I then, I've got the Apogee too, and it's, it's a great mic. You do have to be very careful with popping. Yeah. You're bringing up a really good point right now because I have my uh, Neumann off to the side about five inches from me and I'm cross talking it, mm. right? So the diaphragm, if it were an eyeball, is looking right at my mouth. I've got it vertically positioned so it's mm -hmm. right where my mouth is. Don't say eyeball. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, as if it were an eyeball uh, <laughs> looking at my mouth um, so that I don't have to deal with, uh, you know, a pop screen or, or anything like that because, uh, yeah, speaking directly into your mic, even sometimes when you have a pop screen, you can still pop the mic just like that. Yep. Um, but, uh, I think it's really important to also point out that along with the space that you're voicing in, along with the equipment, I cannot stress enough how important proper mic position is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's super, super important. And unfortunately, uh, when I'm approached by students, I get this a lot. Well, when I, you know, when I look on the videos and they're in the studio, the, the mic's way up here. And I'm like, yeah, but it's also a 12 by you know 15 room mm. yeah. that's been treated and the room's not going to respond so for instance if i back off my mic like this even if i raise my voice you're going to start hearing my room yeah right so the closer you are to the mic the the more you can lower your gain so the better your uh, noise to signal ratio plus you get proximity effect with a lot of mics plus so. you get proximity now for me i get hired a lot for that in your ear read but yeah. i can also back that off in eq uh, after the fact but right? i'd can, also like to it. point out here that this is genre dependent as well because for is. instance mm -hmm. although i work to some degree in all the genres i work anybody who knows me knows i work a lot in audiobooks and the standard isn't to be real up on the mic. So what I usually tell people, one of the biggest mic placement issues I see is people being too close, actually. Right. Yes. And in terms of popping, in terms of breathing, because, you know, in audiobooks, you don't remove the breaths. Because, frankly, you would go insane if you're going to do that for, like, 10 hours of material. I have um, no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> um, no, I, I agree with you 100%. And I don't do audiobooks. I don't do, yeah. I don't do uh, long-form stuff. I'm in and I'm out. That, get, that eating of the mic is a problem with radio people. They're so used to getting yeah. their lips right on the grill to get yeah, that. Yeah, but, like, for instance, for books, it's what's best is to have that pop screen two to three inches from your mic. Mm. And then for you to be six to eight inches away from that. Yeah. So 
And in, in that position, you're getting rid of the vast majority of the pops. You're getting rid of the loud <gasps> kind of gasping breaths, although you yep. shouldn't be doing that anyway, but you know. Yeah. Um, now, now again, though, this, this is assuming that you have a, a well-treated space. space. Exactly. That's Because, again, if you back off that mic, um, you know, I'm not going to say that getting closer to the mic is a Band-Aid, but Amanda's absolutely right. Uh, you know, it's it's a give and take type of thing. Well, so and like for promo, it. for instance, which which I know you do, um, mm-hmm. you got to be right up on it. Yeah, you do. You need to be in their head. So it, it, sure. it depends really a lot on the genre. And, you know, if you're doing animation, you have to be able to yell. So yep. there's there's a lot of different things to think about depending on like there's not a lot of silver bullet information for that kind of stuff for like yeah. overall you know there's not like one thing that you can do for every instance it's dependent a lot of on what you're trying to accomplish yeah so. great point amanda i'm glad that you brought that up i'd like to bring it back a little bit here because i <laughs> want to talk about <laughs> this is the problem we got three yeah. engineers and we could totally go <laughs> off on one forgetting that we've We've abandoned the, the people starting out. Um, so I want to talk about the space. Um, yeah. Now, I'm going to blow everyone's mind here and tell you that I'm in a closet right now. Um, Whoa. Oh, I know. I'm not surprised. Yeah. Um, you can hear it? <laughs> no, uh, no, I can't hear it. I can't hear it. No, but I'm just not surprised yeah. because mm-hmm. you can make it sound good. I'm yeah. I'm in a temporary home right now. We're, we're sort of choosing our next location. So I've set up in a closet and it's, I don't know... Well, it's probably about six foot square. It's not. It's not totally square, which is good. Um, in New York City, I'm like that sounds luxurious. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's my living room. That's like a whole apartment. <laughs> um, but this studio has not got a ton of fancy acoustic treatment. It's got some um, Aurelex style foam, which is a brand of foam manufacturer specifically for audio. It's also got a few chunks of just random upholstery foam and things like that different thicknesses different different uh shapes and a ton of junk and frankly (laughs) junk is some of the best acoustic treatment stuff if you're in a small space because it what it does is it diffuses as well as absorbs the sound yeah and diffusion is much more even in how it treats the sound as opposed to absorption which absorbs across the frequency spectrum differently depending on the foam you're using so what you're aiming for in a, any kind of recording space with the voice particularly is quite an even amount of absorption across the frequency spectrum. So your voice sounds like it does just without any of the uh, reverberation in the space that you're in. And if right. you absorb and diffuse equally across the, fre- the spectrum, everything is getting absorbed and diffused at the same rate. Um, so I find that experimentation is the key if you don't have a big budget if you can get in your space and set up your mic, do a bit of recording, bring in some stuff, put them in the put it in the corners because that's where a lot of bass book gets built up, mm-hmm. and then experiment. Bring in some foam, bring in some acoustic foam, bring in just random bits and pieces like uh, Tim said. Bring in uh, packing uh, yeah. blankets, things like that, and a real mixture of stuff. I find creates the best possible sound. And it when you're first starting out, what it looks like, you know, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter no. what it looks like. So no, it really doesn't matter. So yeah, go from that point, and you know, so long as you've got junk in your house, which everyone does, <laughs> um, yeah. you'll be fine. <laughs> just just don't use like big open storage bins without a lid. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Things it, with mass. To make yeah. it sound tubby, but it's funny because as as uh, an engineer, when you're monitoring, you know, you might be mis- uh, mixing a track or something. Uh, we think of diffusion as our friend in that regard. Mm. But you're bringing up a really great point, which is diffusion in the booth. And I love that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's something you can do for cheap because any, any uh, item that has mass and has a funny shape is going to scatter the, the sound waves, which is what exactly. diffusion does. Exactly. Like you just yeah. look at it like in the same way that you think about reflecting light. You know, yeah. if you have a bunch of surfaces that are pointing in different directions so that those waves are going to be like ping, ping in all different directions and not be bouncing back and forth of the same surfaces like a ping pong ball, um, that's what you're trying to avoid and it's really easy to do because most things are not the same shape as other things so. yeah that's a great point a uh, great point you know it's just uh bouncing light jamie as a photographer you certainly understand that mm. um i do the same thing in my control room i have two lights bouncing up into the corner uh on cards and i let it come back down to me and it just really softens it so amanda that's a great analogy 
I find people are a lot of people are more visually based, so I mm, try to yeah. use. Yeah. Um, not everyone's a weird engineer type like us, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I want to get into talking about um, audio flow and things like that. I was I think of uh, plumbing and pipe work and stuff like that mm. as, as signal flow. Yeah. That seems to help. Um, so we're basically saying here that the space is of paramount importance when you're setting up your first yeah. uh, recording studio, home studio, should I say. And you can make leaps and bounds when you start in terms of going from just an empty room to a pretty decent sounding space. Mm -hmm. As you spend more and more money, those improvements get incrementally smaller. So going from a $600 mic to yeah. a $2,000 mic is it's not like a big difference really in reality. Well, it depends a lot on where what it's going into and like what it's coming from, you know, like that's why I think Tim, you know, bringing up the space is, is such a, that's such an important point because you know, it's not as sexy as buying like a new piece of fancy equipment, you know, mm -hmm. and it's not as definitive. It's like Jamie, you were saying earlier, there's a lot of trial and error and that can be frustrating. Mm. And so we have this urge to just run out and buy like a cool piece of tech. But, you know, if you have a certain level of mic, like we talked about earlier in a less than ideal space, then it's not going to sound great. And I think the same thing will happen where the interface that the mic is going into, you know, also affects its potential and yeah, and what you do with the sound afterwards in your DAW, uh, digital audio workstations, the software for anyone who doesn't know. Um, they all affect each other. So mm. it is kind of counterproductive sometimes to get, say, you run out and you're like, oh, I'm going to get this $2,000 mic. And you're like, well, but everything else you have, like, don't think it's going to magically you know, increase your quality by like 200% or something is not necessarily going to do that. Like Jamie right. was saying, it's incremental so that you'll buy one thing. And also price isn't, once you get to a certain point, price doesn't necessarily mean better for you mm. because different mics do sound different on different people. And there is a possibility that a given $600 mic just complements your voice better than a given three thousand dollar mic. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, it's a thing. I think that's a really important distinction because, guys, we see this in the forums all the time, uh, where everyone has an opinion on, you know, well, four sixteen sounds like crap. Well, <laughs> maybe for you it sounds like crap, but I'm sorry, I just did a job that you know brought in five hundred bucks right. on a four sixteen, and they they're telling me it sounds great. So, you know, it's it's all really relative, yeah. but it is a garbage in, garbage out conversation yeah. and this really goes back to what i was saying earlier about these youtube comparisons mm -hmm. yeah if you're listening on earbuds are you going to be able to tell the difference okay <laughs> fine uh you can't really hear <laughs> now let's go into the studio yeah and let's throw them on the 10 inch monitors and now all of a sudden the u87 just has this big bottom end to it yeah, yeah. and and this kind of smooth buttery you know thing going on and then that gets reproduced in the movie theater, right, mm -hmm. right. So for for televisions, for radio, you know, does it matter that much? Probably not. But you can also take the conversation in the other direction because I've had people contact me with you know an MXL uh, mic uh, that's one hundred and forty dollar buy, and then Jamie, I think I sent you the video of the pre and the post um, of what yeah. we did with this guy. Yeah, and you know, that's it sounded right. just infinitely better. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and but on that note, I think it's also important to throw this in because I know we're going here anyway. If you don't understand EQ. If you don't understand compression, if you don't understand gating, and really gating is kind of a four-letter word in the in the <laughs> in the world of VO, especially for engineers, because what we really should be using is is a form called downward expansion. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Let's um, hang on. Which, hang on, Tim. Let's back up yeah. here. Um, we're talking about the processing of audio once it's got into your computer. Right. 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 Correct. So this is this is all post processing after you've recorded and what you're going to do yeah. to. To treat that so thanks jamie the fact um, that it should be post is probably what you're getting to tim though I think. yes yeah. it, re it really should especially if you're starting out so like right now i'm on the apollo twin i've got this uh pre that i've got loaded a preamp and i've got some eq and some and some light compression on it and i prefer it that way because i want to print that and if i'm having a live session i want it to sound the best that it can to them so that they don't have to work on my audio too much mm -hmm. but yeah. when you're starting out it's really, really important that you are well-informed. And well-informed does not mean go and find one source 
and then roll with it because right. if someone can tell Absolutely. you to normalize your audio uh, to minus three because it's the industry standard mm. and you don't know the difference between peak normalization and RMS oh, normalization no. yeah. Yeah. and normal RMS for people who are listening root mean squared. That's what that stands for. Mm-hmm. You could probably very quickly, quickly get the idea that that means averaging of some sort. And when you do that, you're going for a baseline average level. Right. And so you can end up with a VO that's just consistently the same level and it sounds overly compressed. And so anyway, it's really easy to train wreck yourself yeah. if you go in thinking you know, but then you don't. And unfortunately, you only have to do that one or two times to an engineer before he just deletes your audition. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Because he knows, he knows what to expect. Well, and also... I think it's also worth pointing out because you said that, that there is, just so you guys know, there's no advantage, there's no difference between applying these effects after the fact or before. Yeah. You know, I mean, people will say, well, won't it sound better if I have it EQ'd going in? Not if you, if you do that same EQing to your audio afterwards, it's the same result. Just so long as you give yourself plenty of headroom before you hit your converter. Sure, sure, yeah. I mean... But what I'm saying is that you're not missing out on anything by applying this after the fact. Absolutely. And you're also, you're protecting yourself because when you have the raw audio and you're applying effects afterwards, you can undo it. Yeah. Very, very good point. Mm -hmm. And on that note, here's what I do. Just a quick thing for you beginners, for everyone, really. When I finish doing a job, I will immediately save it with the title raw after the name of the project. Mm -hmm. Then I will immediately save it as the name of the project. So no matter what I do to it, I've always got that raw file. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if something goes wrong, I can go back to it. Not only that, but if if I edit out a bunch of takes and they say, hey, do you have anything different? I can always go back to the raw and see what alts I might have. So that's a really good practice. One of the things that's going to be difficult when people start out is to know what does sound good and what what is overly processed so or what their room is doing to the sound for example um one investment that people rarely talk about in terms of uh improving the quality of your product is getting a good set of ears to listen to it and to Mm -hmm. give you feedback on that so let's talk about that how how does someone go and get some information about what their sound quality is like Okay, so I do that a lot, and um, you know I have students. I I set mm-hmm. up racks, and I also teach a longer course where people can learn everything that they yeah. would possibly want to know about this stuff. But I can be contacted at info at VOTechGuru dot com. Right. By the way, I did not give myself the name Viotech Guru. It was given to me. I hate it. It sounds like I'm coming down off the mountain with tablets in my hand. But I was named that and it stuck and so be it. I ran with it. But hey, anyway, it's the a pl- brand, you know. Yeah. It's a brand. It's a brand. Yeah. I don't um, deny it. But I also the- do studio consults um, oh, good. Okay. as well. And my I don't have I don't have a snappy name. I wish <laughs> I did. I'm jealous. That's really cool. Um <laughs> it's just Amanda Rose Smith at Gmail dot com that's me give me something give me a few seconds i'll come up with something reductive that i can can. (laughs) hang on hang on it's coming (laughs) it's coming well i i will i will say this um when i first got into voiceover uh way back in the day i used to produce uh music and Mm -hmm. uh perform produce the whole nine yards and I have a very strong r&d and construction background so going into this thing i thought hey no sweat how hard could it be? Mm. Well, I ended up tearing apart my entire first booth <laughs> because I realized I really yeah. didn't know what I was talking about. So now at this point, I'm partnering with Green Glue and we're doing all this stuff because I've learned, uh, you mm. know, just how effective a proper build can be. And totally. it's one of those things where you think it sounds good. Until you listen to yourself three months later Mm, and then because you've gotten that help and then you go to listen to something that you submitted before and you almost want to call that person (laughs) and apologize (laughs) (laughs) for sending them that audio. So and, and, and by the way, to everyone listening out there. Uh, there are diminishing returns as you start to get into that upper echelon, okay? Mm. Yeah. You you will make small little improvements, but you can also make a huge leap from where you are now mm-hmm. uh, and, and get yourself in a winning position if you're teed up properly. And that is the most important thing to remember about this part of this discussion is there's this idea that it sounds good to me, so I'll send it in, 
okay? But once you put it in contrast to how someone yeah. else may sound, you may say, oh boy, I'm in trouble. Well, one thing you can do immediately is to compare yourself to people already out there in the market. I know I have a right. couple of people out sure. there, and I'm not going to name any names because it's embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> but I use them as a, a comparison for anything that I put out in the world. So I can I know their stuff is super, super high quality. Yeah. And, you know, I've been doing this for years. I've been an engineer for, I don't know, nearly 20 years now. Um, but you, wow. it's very hard to get a perspective on your own stuff. Totally. Truly, and, truly. But that's what's so great also about, you know, there's a really strong community mm. um, in this industry. And I think that anybody, uh, I mean, this is probably counterproductive because we're on a podcast. So it's I'm not like I can tell you people to join the internet because you're on it. But, <laughs> um, but, you know, there are a lot of Facebook forums and forums in other places where a lot of accomplished professionals talk about this stuff and I think that, you know, when you connect with your industry, you can definitely get a feeling for who's kind of, who's doing well, who kind of knows what they're talking about. Yeah. Like, I always recommend that people lurk for a while and kind of get a sense of that. And then, you know, listen to their stuff. Like Jamie said, it's a really good idea to do, to do that. And also, you, you can... Um, ask fellow VOs to maybe take a quick listen. Be respectful of people's time. I mean, yeah. you know, the, the 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 phrase "pick your brain" has got to be like <laughs> yeah. the most, you know. Um, but also, and then also hire people, you know, that specialize in this kind of thing. And I would also encourage people to get multiple perspectives. I mean, and going back to that point, Tim, that you made about like the YouTube stuff and running with like one set of advice yeah. i think if you want to avoid falling into that trap because it's the kind of thing that anyone starting out in anything can fall into because you just don't know you know mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. but if you look at multiple sources you can form an aggregate you know and when you yeah. find like five people saying the same thing then it kind of gets to a point where you're like okay this sort of seems to be the industry standard yeah this seems to be an explanation that i've heard several different ways and then you can get confident with that and go and i know a lot of people it's an exciting field you want to like go out and get started right away but doing your research and sort of approaching it in that methodical way is a really really important thing to do because yeah like i said it's a supportive community but it's also a small community and you know like tim was saying earlier about you know you only need to see someone's name a few times and have you know before you start deleting their audition <laughs> peep you only have one chance to make a first impression yeah so it's a really good idea to take advantage of the resources that are out there and kind of take a beat and make sure that you're doing what you want to be doing and then go out and start submitting stuff because it's, I know we get impatient and it's hard to wait, but the rewards that you will reap for doing that are significant. So Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's really important also, uh, and this is why I'm glad that we're having this particular podcast uh, with, with the people who are on this call right now, is because I know for a fact that both of you guys absolutely know your stuff. And it's really not that hard. The problem with most scenarios that I run into uh, with first contact from someone who's looking for help is they're searching the forums and they just can't figure out this from that. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why is because a newbie uh, goes into the forum, they ask a question, and then everyone wants to sound like the smartest person in the room mm -hmm. suddenly. Yeah. So they start using all of these esoteric terms, you know, and they're asking about compression. And the person says, well, it depends. And they're asking about EQ. And, well, it depends. And that's all true. Mm -hmm. But it's also easy enough to break down the, you know, what a compressor does uh, just by saying, guys, tell them it's an automatic volume leveler. Like, mm. at least give them some idea that it controls the peaks, that it doesn't let the peaks get out of yeah. control. You know, you don't need to go into this, well, it depends on your threshold and your ratio and your attack right. time and then your release <laughs> and your makeup gain. It's like, guys, just they're just looking for, like, a basic overview so they can get an idea. The stuff that you're saying right now is just putting them in a tailspin yeah. and discouraging them. Yeah. So I would, I would tell people out there, when you, when you are out there and you're, and you're listening at, to that stuff, look for the people who are breaking it down in a simple way, because those are the people who have figured out that 
you need to know this stuff and they have a way to articulate it to you and they actually want to help it help you versus showing you how smart they are yeah i completely agree and and when you're starting out simplicity is your friend because yes you know you can you can basically screw things up any number of ways yeah <laughs> with audio yep. um it's a yep. bit like if someone was uh, to make themselves dinner you know if you've got no concept of how to cook something you know you're not going to launch into some really complicated dinner you'll just make yourself something very simple and it'll work you know it'll yeah and simple can be really good too i mean there's something to be said there are certain things you know, in certain kinds of settings, you can just kind of start out with it. Like Tim was saying earlier about how in the earlier stages, you can improve yourself by leaps and bounds. Mm. There are some very basic EQ and compression settings that are straightforward that will do that, that you'll just be like, whoa, oh, that made a huge difference. Yeah. And it's um, almost always the case. I, yeah. I, I tell people this. If you think about a chef who's making soup, they're not throwing in a handful of salt and then a dash of pepper. It's mm-hmm. a little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper, a little bit of saffron. These, these are the things combined that make it sound good. Yeah. If you hit it with too much compression, it really doesn't matter what your EQ sounds like. And the salting okay. is a good, good example because you can't, you can't unbake that. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yeah. When someone starts out, we were talking about USB versus different kind of microphones earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's, there's two real routes that you can take when you start out. You can buy a mic a USB mic, which basically just plugs straight into your computer, and that's all you need to worry about. You get the so- recording software on your computer, and it's all taken care of. Everything is done within that that mic. Versus buying a standard microphone that you'd see right. someone at a gig singing into a microphone. You know, it's it's kind of dumb. It just plugs into another bit of kit, which converts that audio into a digital signal, which then the computer can understand. Well, and that's exactly it. What a lot of people don't understand, and when I'm trying to explain my dislike of usb mics because people are like why it's so easy why do you why don't you like it i'm like well because here's the thing all microphones produce analog information Mm. that doesn't change when you have you know a usb microphone so what that means is you still have this you know this microphone taking in analog information Mm. and it still has to be converted to digital information for your computer to understand it but rather than there being a whole big you know, separate module that does that because that's what the audio, like you said, that's what the audio interface is. Is it literally converts that analog information into digital information? Mm. You basically have a tiny version of that inside the microphone. Yeah. And this starts to like date me, and I think the longer I use this analogy, it gets less relevant to people. But I'm still gonna do it. Um, it's like those old combination TV VCRs, right? <laughs> Where mm. you never had one of those and thought. This is the best TV I've ever owned. And this is the most awesome VCR in the world, which these days is a weird phrase to even say to begin yeah. with. But well, like, at least at least update it to a combination <laughs> TV DVD. DVD. Okay, yeah, no. you're right. I should do that. I should do that. Okay, so let's pretend I said that. Um, and but you know, you've never had one of those and thought this is the best in the world. No, yeah. you're like it's it's cool. It's all right. You know, and that's kind of where you're at. Because because they had to take that whole piece of technology, right, and shove it inside the mic. Yeah. I mean, it, there's, a, there's a quality ceiling, and it manifests in a number of ways. Often you'll have self-noise. Like, sometimes people will be like, oh, my space is so quiet, I don't understand it. But then when I listen to my audio, I hear this constant shh. And what that often is, is a symptom of bad analog-to-digital conversion which you will have in a less than audio interface, which is basically what's been shoved inside that microphone. So the blue, while the blue Yeti is a great example. Oh, of that. oh don't guess. The blue, the blue <laughs> Yeti is something that is great for YouTube. It's great for, you know, sure, certain yeah. voiceover jobs, but also uh, to be fair, the blue Yeti, um, there are noise reduction of very affordable noise reduction plugins these days that can knock that kind of stuff down. But the point that you're making that is is the same thing I always say. Mm. It's like, imagine fitting an Avalon 737 inside an Apogee mic capsule. 
<laughs> it, you know, we're not there yet. Mm-hmm. Will we be? I am absolutely confident that yes, we yeah, will get there. Probably eventually. Yeah. yeah, eventually we will get there. Um, we're we're on the edge. In the same way, uh, this goes back to the conversation that we were having earlier about plugins versus uh, being front loaded with your chain and then processing in post. If you go back not too long ago, you didn't have that would not have been the conversation right because the plugins were just not robust enough that's true they they they, the quality wasn't high enough they hadn't figured it out bit rates and so on and so forth but these days yeah we reached that tipping point and it happened a while ago Mm -hmm. Uh, you know it's not like it happened just yesterday this has been around for a while and so Mm -hmm. doing things in post uh is is just a wonderful way to go about doing it especially if you're new because you get to experiment yeah uh you get to save another uh you know duplicate file of it that's not affected right Mm -hmm. and then and there is no better way i'm convinced of this there is no better way to learn how to use a piece of hardware than to use the virtual version yeah. of that in a plugin. Absolutely. Yeah. There's no better way. No better way cuz you get to monitor while you're doing it versus speaking into it while you're trying to turn all these knobs on a on a right. real, you know, physical piece of equipment. So So let's talk about now uh your DAW and that is as Amanda said earlier your digital audio workstation which is the software that you use to manipulate the audio mm-hmm. once it's in your computer. Yes. And what we're talking about here is when you're starting out, there's an awful lot of uh, stuff that you need to learn, compression, equalization, gating, you know, the list goes on. Not as much as in music, thankfully, but um, all these stages are potential um, banana skins, really, for sort of messing up your audio. So if you've got a healthy signal-to-noise ratio, which means mm-hmm. that the sound of your voice is loud enough compared to the ambience of your room and the noise that your technology introduces... Do you need to then apply anything to that, or is is that enough? How do you it treat depends. that? Mm. It depends. It depends. <laughs> that's the uh, the response that Tim was was. But is that your job as a voice actor to to work with that? Um, I can address that uh, if you don't mind, Amanda, sure, because sure. Um, of the teaching aspect of what I do. So here's I get asked this question all the time, mm. and when I am dealing with a new client for a, a project. Uh, once in a while they'll say, Hey, don't do anything to your audio at all. Um, which, you know, I always do. And I've never heard back from anybody who said, Hey, don't do any, you know, I told you not to do anything to your audio, right? <laughs> <I'm> because, <the> <laughs> same. <laughs> because what they're getting from me once I deliver it is they're getting something that has a kiss of, you know, nice compression yeah. e- EQ'd into a, into a better state than it was before. So the conversation for me is this. If you're in a booth, you are in a box, all right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, right around 500 hertz, we know where this is, right? Honk, uh, which mm-hmm. is usually mm-hmm. referred to in the music industry. If you are improving the signal before you're sending it to them, okay, you're just removing, because that's job number one, take away the stuff that we don't like. So rolling off on the low end to get rid of a lot of the noise, sure. mm-hmm. maybe cut some of the boxiness. If you did just that, you could greatly improve your audio. But the thing is, is that people want, they have it in their mind that if they send it in and it sounds like a promo trailer, then somehow that's going to impress the other person Mm -mm. and they're just going to be like, wow, this is the greatest thing that I've ever heard. And, Mm. you know, that's (laughs) that's not what's happening out there, guys. The real pros, and and, uh, J. Michael Collins says the same exact thing that I do because I cast from time to time. The first 80% of what you get goes in the trash can because it has audio problems or it's a yeah. misread they're not right for the part whatever then yeah. you have this 80 to 90 percent that usually consists of people who are killing the read but the audio is bad or vice versa yeah. and then mm-hmm. you have this top 10 percent that people sometimes like to complain about which is where the audio is killer the read is killer and so of course they're getting the majority of the work yeah right sure so but the answer is is that if you know enough just enough to be dangerous you probably shouldn't do anything at all to your audio yeah okay but if you're trained or you have someone who who really knows what they're doing and they've got you teed up properly uh then yes absolutely yes because Um, the chance of you getting oh sorry karen karen um, oh well i was just gonna say to go off sort of what when he was talking about like a, a kiss of compression and that kind of thing um this is this is a girly metaphor, but it's kind of like the natural look, 
you know, <laughs> yeah. a lot of a lot of women might be familiar with that where you're wearing a little bit of makeup to look like you're not wearing makeup. Right. And it's the same kind of thing where if you can do something subtle, like, yeah, like do a little roll off of the way base frequencies and maybe just a teeny tiny bit of compression, it should still s- really what you're doing there in a way is making it sound like you just have a slightly better space right. than maybe you really do. And it's kind of a matter of, well, can they tell that mm. I did something to it? You know, and that's a really hard, that's a really hard distinction to make, especially if you're new. Yeah. But like Tim said, it, you know, there are people, you know, both of us included, I believe, who will make stacks, for mm. instance, who might be able to make you a sort of basic light setting that Mm. will just do a little bit that will kind of give it a little bit of an edge to make it just sound a little bit better. And the reason and the way you're able to do that and someone starting out isn't is because you've edited thousands of hours of audio. (laughs) So you know know what is going to work and what isn't, you know. Exactly. And And you are, after all, voicing in a box. Mm. So if I didn't have this cut that I have right now, I'm running uh, some EQ in real time. But if I boost this up to let people hear what boxiness sounds like, <laughs> okay, mm. this is what boxiness sounds like. And you wouldn't want this in, in your signal. So if you go yeah. in and you remove this, then it obviously sounds much better. Hey, Tim, what, what, what if a voice talent wanted to sound like Darth Vader? <laughs> uh, they'd probably have to have a Darth Vader preset of some sort. I wonder I what that would sound like. I don't know anybody who oh. has that. Hmm. Let me see if I can find something here. <laughs> I find your lack of faith disturbing. <laughs> what is it, General? You are part of the VO Alliance. <laughs> Right. That's so good. Do you use that when you're teaching? I feel like you could really get a student's attention. Sometimes I do, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Just to loosen them up, and you know, because a lot of them are nervous. And um, let me switch back here. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Darth mean? off camera, you know? Yeah, Darth off camera, exactly. <laughs> Uh, uh, cut, cut. What, what was the problem? Yeah, uh, yeah. I actually do that to kind of loosen them up because a lot of them actually get really nervous. You yeah. know, it, it's funny how that works when people are, uh, and that's another, another bit of advice I would like to give to people is that, look, you don't know what you don't know. Mm-hmm. And yeah. the, the, one of the wonderful things about the VO community, which is happening on this podcast right now is we care, right? Yeah. We, uh, Joe Cipriano really put it best. Uh, he said that we make it in this business by standing on each other's shoulders. Oh, sure. And mm-hmm. I've never seen an industry that is more willing to help others succeed yeah. uh, ever. I mean, it, it, it really is incredible. Yeah. And so if you see someone like me who does a tutorial on YouTube or, or whatever, or you've seen me voice for any number of brands, it's easy to get into your head that, wow, you know, this is, uh, uh, I'm dealing with this guy and I don't <laughs> know if I'm going to ask the right questions. Just forget all that because we're all just people. Sure. That's it. And we want to help you. And so when you reach out, you know, uh, look, the only thing that you really need to remember when you're asking for help is be nice. Yeah. Yeah. Just be nice. And we all yeah. started somewhere. I mean, I tell people, so I, I started as a classical, a classical musician and a composer. So I originally got into engineering, um, because I wanted to record my own music. Um, but I didn't know anything about the tech stuff. And I'm like, look, 14 years ago, I was on the phone with tech support at Sweetwater <laughs> for an hour before I figured out I had plugged my input into my output. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. We've all had that, those stories. Here. Granted, yeah, yeah, that was a long time ago. doesn't happen as often anymore. But <laughs> we all have to start somewhere. It's not like any of us just sort of like, you know, crawled one day out of a studio and knew everything and then that's just how it was you know we all we all know what it's like to be at that point and anybody who makes you feel less than for being at that point now isn't somebody that you want to work with anyway yeah run like hell yeah that happens because you're dealing with ego and when you're dealing with ego um every session that you have with that person is going to be about how great they are yeah and and how much they're helping you Okay, so that's true. That's very run true. like hell if that happens. Those totally. people do exist. Yep. They do exist. Okay, 
Um, but, you know, Amanda, really, really well put uh, point because I always say to people when they get embarrassed about doing this, I say, look, you're not a pro until you've done a VO into the back of your mic. that's because you did a tear down and you're you know you got a new piece of equipment and you're like "Ah, what's wrong with my mic you know so 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 there's no stupid question the only stupid question is one that's not asked you just yeah you just ask and and you'll get an answer and it's funny that it's actually really funny that you bring that up because uh several years ago i was working as a production manager at a studio in town and we had a new engineer he had just come out of school um you know, really enthusiastic, great kid. And a couple months into working there, we had this one day where we had this new this new microphone. It was a Gefell. And unlike the vast majority of microphones um, where the front of the mic, you know, that picks up the majority of your sound if you're using a cardioid mic, um, this one, you know, usually they have the label on the front and then that's how you know what the front is. But this mm. one had the label on the back. Mm. And... We were recording audiobooks that day, and he recorded an entire day, oh, a six-hour no. session mm. with the talent. And he was sitting there from to hear him tell it afterwards, because I didn't you know, find out until the end. Um, he was doing all this stuff, and he was changing the preamps, and he was changing these settings and Pro Tools. And finally, at the end of the day, we were having this conversation. He was so distraught, and I was like, why didn't you just come in and ask me? Mm. I would have known this has happened to me before. Yeah. I would have told you exactly what it was right away. And he said, well, I was afraid that you'd think I didn't know what I was doing. And I'm like, well, this helps. <laughs> <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> I'm like, don't ever, I'm like, don't ever be afraid to ask people. People want to help you. And yeah. like, like Tim said, run like hell if they don't, because there are so many people that do and that will that will just give, you know, they'll give you advice and that will, they want you to succeed. So just don't, don't be, don't not ask questions because you're afraid that people will think you don't know what you're doing. Um, People ask questions. I ask questions all the time. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Why why wouldn't you, if you don't know, I mean, you don't know what you don't know. And if, if you, if there ever comes a day when you're not learning, then just pull the plug. You know, that's, that's, that's my take on it. You know, yeah. we're, we're constantly growing and evolving. And, and by the way, a uh, little side note, we had a discussion about a, a RE20 mic and a few others, and we were talking about side address and front mm. address and top address. And yeah. I had put something on there and our good friend Emmett Andrews had, had chimed in and someone else said, well, they're all side address mics. And I was like, all right, Emmett. <laughs> so, so the reason I make, the reason I'm making that point is because if you have a microphone where the diaphragm is pointing out the top of the mic and you're speaking into the side of the mic, which is a more traditional way mm. yeah. uh, to speak into a, uh, into a, a microphone, uh, you know, we have stage mics where you talk directly into them, but most voiceover mics, uh, have the diaphragm on the side of the mic. Yeah. Okay. And so if you are having problems, and I've run into this quite a few times where people are saying, well, I just, I don't know, it just doesn't sound right. And I'm thinking of returning it. I'm like, okay, look, turn the mic. Yeah. And yeah. they turn the mic and they're like, whoa. Right. Yeah. So <laughs> well, it's, in, uh, in general, it, it happens. It's, it's super fun, actually, I think. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm weird. I think it's super fun. Uh, To just go in the booth and you have your mic and to just move it all around, all around, all different positions, above, below, side, whatever, um, and just listen. And just, it's the same thing. I mean, I'm not going to say it's completely trial and error because it's not. I mean, mics do have, they literally scientifically have certain positions where they sound Mm. better. But at the same time... You know, much like creating your space, there are little things you can tweak. And yeah, don't don't go through the trouble of returning something if you haven't fully explored it yet. And it I mean, takes a while, I think, to get used to any new piece of equipment and a microphone yeah. very specifically, because you can use it in so many different ways. We've been we've touched on it today. You can get right on the mic and get a really mm-hmm. close uh, presence, and you can back off the mic, especially if you're yelling and screaming if you're doing like, video games. Hello, Jamie. Yeah, there we go. Perfect, <laughs> lovely. <laughs> but you can experiment with that, and you can use the mic to your advantage you know particularly depending on what kind of read you're going for so Mm -hmm. you know there's trial and error and 
absolutely asking questions this is this is how all of us learn and the other thing is that schools of thought change over time and different technologies come into being True, so yeah. to think that you know everything now and it's never going to change is is ignorant really well and i really like that point that tim brought up where he talked about the technology changes um with plugins for instance yeah because you do run into a lot of like i run in all the time i run into engineers who you know are a little bit older than me who just say no we must do this processing on the way in because they're still in that you know they you know they did a lot of engineering in like the 90s or whatever and Mm. the digital stuff wasn't quite there way back in the 90s (laughs) (laughs) i don't know man i wasn't an engineer in the 90s yet but uh. i'm staying completely quiet because you guys think you're aging yourselves i'll put this in perspective and any like real quote real engineers out there listening are probably going to gasp and just i've never cut tape i never have never needed to wow um you know and i've been an engineer for a while like over a decade um but i just never needed to do it and that that just happens you know that Mm. the the schools what you need to do and what the common practices are change the funny thing is, I have cut tape, but it was only because the school that I went to was so old and ancient, and that was like the most <laughs> modern equipment that they had. But that's nothing to, that's nothing to shout about. Well, I mean, I just bring it up as a point that, like, there are certain things that are benchmarks, you know, at some point, and that people will say, and they change. Absolutely. They change over time. So there comes a point, yeah, where now the digital plugins, they are as good. They are. Mm. Mm. They weren't before, but they are now. And things like that will change over time. And that's why, you know, and Tim's like, well, when you're not learning, pull the plug. Totally. Because especially in a tech-related field, it's always changing. And you have to keep up on it. And you have to, like, one of the examples I also bring up is that, you know, I learned, the software I learned on was Pro Tools. Because at the time, Mm. it was really the only thing out there. Um, That's not true now. There are lots of different things. And... You know, I make a conscious effort to be like, okay, well, now I'm going to spend some time on Reaper, and now I'm going to spend some time on Studio One, and now I'm going to spend some time on Logic and on Cubase, and, you know, and, oh, look, Twisted Wave, oh, even Audacity, which is free, just to get, you know, Mm. and I think it's really... And Adobe Audition, and Adobe Audition. Yeah, well, yeah, and Audition, actually, that's (laughs) one of the ones I have less experience with, but I've, I've liked it a lot when I've used it. Well, we'll talk, we'll talk. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> um, and, and they're Can you different. Tell I'm biased? Well, you know, it's funny because I have different favorites for different things. Like, yeah, for instance, absolutely. I'm a composer, so when I compose, I like using Logic. Yeah, I, find, I use Logic too, absolutely. Um, when I record most audio, just sort of as a general thing, and when I work at studios, it's usually Pro Tools because it's still kind of like mm-hmm. the most common one. You know, when I'm talking to VO artists, depending on what they're recording, if they want to do audiobooks, I usually recommend Reaper. But if they're doing shorter stuff, I usually recommend Twisted Wave yeah. because it's so simple and kind of, well, if they have a Mac. because If they have comes. a Mac, yeah. yeah. Well, and talking about technology changes, I mean, Twisted Wave on the iPad even is really good. It you know, is. It is. It's it is. Yeah. so instinctive. I love the way you can just I get in there. I used it for field it. recording. When I went on my honeymoon, I went to Bali right. and I had this little, I know I'm like, USB mics are bad, but I totally <laughs> had one that I plugged into the iPad and I had Twisted Wave and I was like recording people doing various things. And You came over to the dark side. I looked like such a nerd. I'm like, hello, I'm a terrorist. Please take my iPad. Yeah. Luckily, no one did. <laughs> All right. It. So the final thing, and we're getting to the end here. Is, I'm we're surprised we've kept. Are you well, serious? we're getting close. I think we've been doing this nearly an hour now. I know that's oh, wow. surprising. Um, I want to talk about uh, file formats and delivery standards and mm. uh, file transfer because this is something that is not particularly particularly sexy, but um, <laughs> it's pretty important. So, uh, who wants to kick off talking about that? I'll kick it off. Sure. Okay. So the thing I'd like to address is uh, recording in stereo. Mm. Um, for those of you who may be using Logic, I understand, um, you know, you're a musician and so you figure, yeah, I can just use this and you can't figure out how to do a mono bus. Um, there are answers on YouTube, so we won't go into that here, but the <laughs> stereo files are twice the size of a mono file. Yeah. From an engineer's perspective, if you send me a stereo file and I've got music panned left and right and my, and my sound effects and all of that, 
And I've got you in both of those speakers in equal energy. Uh, what I'm going to go and do is I'm going to go in there. I'm going to split that stereo track, get myself a mono so I can ride you right down the middle. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So that you're present. You're, you're right down the middle. You're in, in the ear. And so a lot of DAWs out there will, their default for whatever reason, uh, especially, you know, I think, I'm not sure if this is true of Audacity, but I've seen it many times where people will just start recording in yeah. stereo because they're using a DAW that's not specifically meant for voice. Well, I think mm, it's because right? they're, most of them are originally meant for music and music is usually. Right, exactly. Yeah. And so when it, and so the other thing that I would address would be that you should be recording at whatever level your hardware will allow you to record at mm -hmm. uh, bit wise. Okay. Quality wise. Um, now that's going to vary a great deal. So you'll, you'll need to look into it, but also another important thing, cause I get this all the time is when people are saying, Hey, I'm getting a lot of clicks and pops in my audio. This is semi related to this. So I want to mention it mm -hmm. while yeah. it's in mind. If you mess with your buffer settings because you're trying to monitor in real time through your headphones <laughs> and you drop your buffer settings really low, just so you understand what's going on there, there's a cycle from when you speak into the mic, it travels through the computer and then come back and then comes back to your headphones. The yeah. lower that number, the lower the latency. So that's good. But mm. the bad thing is, is now your chip doesn't have enough cycles yeah. during that time to process it. So what that buffer is all about is how much time you're giving your computer to fully process the audio and send yep. it back to you. It's much better mm. to be in an interface with your headphones plugged into that, listening to your audio, live yeah. monitoring, than it yep. is to drop your buffer. So typical buffer size, right around 512. Okay, is usually what is is usually the standard in DAWs anyway. But I, I wanted to point that out because it comes up all the time. Um, yeah. But anyway, MP3s versus waves. I think Amanda, why don't you tackle that one? Okay, so I'm going to use the visual analogy again because it seems to get a lot of mileage. Um, so MP3s are compressed. There's no such thing as natively recording in MP3, um, and that's a really important thing to understand because. Um, you are always natively recording in wave, right? That's your HD, uncompressed, big file, everything's there. Um, and then you can convert that to MP3. And there are a number of reasons why you want to do that. Obviously, if you're sending a file like an audition, they don't need a whole huge thing. You know, yeah. it's it's much easier to send that through email. Um, finished products, you know, generally if it's a book or something that people are going to download, it's usually MP3 at the end. But while you're recording and while you're editing, it's always going to be wave. Um, and part of that is it's actually impossible to edit an MP3. <laughs> now I know, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh, but I open up MP3s in my DAW all the time, and I edit, and then I send it off. But what your DAW is doing in the background is it's converting that MP3 mm. back to a wave. It's editing it, and then it's reconverting it back to an MP3 and sending it out. And the problem with that is it's kind of like, say you have this nice HD photo of you doing something awesome and you're like, I'm gonna make this my Facebook profile photo so everyone knows how awesome I am. <laughs> um, so you go and you do that and then like your computer crashes or whatever and you no longer have this HD file. So you think, well, that's it's totally cool, it's fine because I have the Facebook profile photo. So you yeah. pull and you open that up and you're like, oh, it's kind of little though, you know, I really want it to be the same size as that other one. You blow it up, what's it gonna look like? Terrible. Pixelated. It's, yeah, yeah. It's going to be all pixelated. You're not going to see. And the reason why is because it was compressed. It was compressed to make it small and it able to be used in that way. And you can't add information back. Mm. Once, you've, once you've compressed something and the way that things are compressed is data is literally removed. You know, there are all sorts of algorithms that determine like which data can we get away with removing to make something small and easy to, you know, send off and use. Yeah, like all the high end uh, frequency stuff, 16K mm -hmm. and above is yeah. wiped out in an MP3. And by the way, on that note, if you're playing a note right around 18K, I mean, most of us, especially if we're adults, we can't hear that. Mm -hmm. But that combined energy from yes. 16K to 20K together gives this shimmer and this yes. kind of airy sound to the audio. Sparkle. So, I hear it called yeah, that all sparkle, the time. Sparkle, sparkle, yeah. exactly. So so the way I like to the way I like to refer to it is on a cymbal when you've got your overheads and you're recording those, mm -hmm. it would be the shh 
the shimmer mm-hmm. and the yeah. air of, of that symbol. And so when you when you dump it down to an MP3, that information is missing. Yeah. And and so there there is, you know, when people say, hey, there's really not that much of a difference between an MP3 and a WAV file. There is. Well, I would challenge that to yeah. a certain degree. If you're listening on an iPhone or something like that, will an advanced ear be able to tell the difference? Yes. Once you play it on a nice system, you're sure going to hear the difference. Oh, yeah. It's funny. You know, I used to be... Um, I was a live sound engineer back in a while ago. I'm not going to say back in the day because then you guys are going to give me all this trouble again. <laughs> Some time ago. Way back in 2005. Uh, 2008. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. All right. It's not that long ago, but whatever. It feels like a long time ago. Um, I used to be a live sound engineer and I worked in a venue that would have, you know, they'd have concerts and then they would have these DJ nights, usually after the concert. Mm. And... Sometimes you'd get these DJs that would have mixed files. Yes, yes. And yeah. we had this big system with all these Meyer speakers that were just, you know, beautiful and great. And because they were really good, you could really tell the difference between yeah. different qualities of audio. It's just um, no low end. Yeah. Yeah. And so people would come, these DJs would come in and they'd be spinning a bunch of, um, you know, uncompressed files. And then all of a sudden, an MP3 would come in. Yes. And everybody would be like, what? And they'd be looking at me, you know, in the booth being like, why did all the sound go bad? <laughs> and because all the low end, you know, in that music just went, yeah. it was just gone. And um, the DJ is probably thinking, well, you know, when I listened on my headphones at home, they yeah. all sounded the same. Right. But they don't on a high quality system. And yeah. as that relates to VO, if you're sending a file that sounds good to you to an engineer who's mixing in a post house that's got mm. subs and, you know, these huge, yeah. great, like, wall monitors and things. They will hear the They difference. will hear it and they will send it right back. <laughs> yeah, so, al- so always ask. Yeah. So mm. always ask what they're looking for because some of the smaller projects, like for web, People will, I mean, I've had auditions that I've sent in in MP3 and then it just gets used for the project. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and then you're oh, like, wow. okay, I mean, yeah, yeah it Hopefully happens. Hopefully with them telling you that they're, that they're going to do that. Yeah, well, I, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> it, depends, it depends on what you get because, uh, you know, I did a, a really, really big brand, a tool brand, and, uh, you know, came back, was really anxious to hear it because I felt I really killed the read. Mm. Uh, I, I killed the read. <laughs> but, the, but the point is, is I sent it in. I was waiting and waiting and waiting. Uh, it was a 25th anniversary thing. Someone obviously oh, wow. threw it over the fence at the last moment because it's got to be on that day, on the 25th anniversary. Mm. So the release on the compressor was so long that at the end of every word, like a buh sounded like buh. <sighs> <You know? laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, it was, just, it was just brutal, you know. So, but, but when it comes down to it, you, if you're not sure, then ask what the specs are and typically what these guys are looking for some are in the know some aren't so they might be asking for 48k Mm -hmm. Uh, some will ask for 44 1 16 bit so for everyone listening out there 44 1 16 bit is cd quality Mm. okay yeah so if you're recording in that format you're more than likely safe at home but sometimes you will get people asking you for 48 Right. Yeah. For for whatever reason, doesn't really matter. It's common matter. in video, so yes, usually it if it's something yeah. that's going to be put to video, for whatever reason, mm-hmm. audio that's going with video is almost always forty eight. But well, and broadcast exactly. stand is twenty four forty eight, isn't it? So uh, that's why that's what I always yeah. record at. I mean, I think we we should also mention that what you're recording at versus what you deliver. So. What right. you want to make sure is that you're recording at a high enough quality that you can always go down mm. um, when you deliver the files. That is to say, you don't have to go up into the 96K ridiculous levels. That's that's not going to yeah. help you at all, and it's going to create huge file sizes that are just going to I think it's going to be rare that you'll ever want more than 48. I mean, even, yeah. you know. Yeah. yeah. So if you record a decent enough uh, setting, like uh, 48K sample rate, 24-bit bit rate, um, you can then convert down to pretty much anything you need to send out. Um, and mm-hmm. so you also get the benefit then of all the plugins working at that rate, which they operate slightly better at that, at the higher um, sample rates. And yeah, rates. they absolutely yeah. do. Well, they it's absolutely like what do. Tim said earlier about having a raw version of something. It's always easier to convert, well, yeah, to convert ta- down because you yeah. can't really convert up. I mean, no. yeah. not in a not in a way that sounds good. But you can, <laughs> but it doesn't give you anything. You can well, you're just sending them the file at that rate because they I want mean, it. But yeah, yeah, I mean it's look, it's possible if you record something and it sounds amazing at forty four one and then they say they want forty eight, I'm not gonna lie. It's not really 
yeah. a huge deal yeah. <laughs> to then convert it to 48. I mean, I, I think that's more of a checklist item for the engineers because they've been told by management, yeah. you know, hey, make sure it's all 48. They're checking it. It comes in in 44. Yeah. One. You know, I, w- I would challenge plenty of people to tell me the difference between 48 and 44. Oh, they one. can't tell. They you can't know, hear it. Yeah. But, but, all, <laughs> but also, if that's not enough about file formats, you had also mentioned something about, um, I think, FTP uploading and whatnot. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. so box to, for people who don't know, that's file, file transfer protocol. Mm. And it's essentially just a way of getting your files uploaded into the cloud, which is how most of us refer to it these days. And so it, you have servers based in, you know, wherever around the world, you upload your file and then, uh, you it sh- have a share link. So you'll click share next to it, uh, to the usual suspects are dropbox.com, mm-hmm. uh, box.com itself. Yeah. Uh, Box.com and Dropbox both have apps uh, for iPad, iPhone, Android, I believe. Um, On a side note, uh, Box.com rewarded me for loading it on all three of my devices and took my storage from 5 gigabytes to 50 gigabytes for free. Wow. Uh, Google Drive is another option. Mm -hmm. If you look at free FTP, uh, look for the popular ones. Okay, look for trusted sites. Mm. Yeah. Don't put yourself in a position where you're looking up free anything and then not knowing what you're clicking on because we all know what happens when someone offers something free mm. yes. uh, or can happen, right? So just make sure it's a reliable source. But uh, guys out there listening, uh, here's how it works. You upload it. Once it's uploaded, there, there'll usually be some sort of a share button. Yeah. You'll share. It will allow you to copy the link. And then you just paste it into your email and you say, here you go. And when they click on it, they're able to go straight to the file and then have the option to preview it typically or listen to or or download it. I'll also say, and this is this is just something that I've sort of noticed and come to find. It's worth having some version of a paid account to one of these just because. Mm. You know, I've been in a lot of situations where people have been like, oh, my free Dropbox is full. Like, I have to do, you know, it just, it's a little, personally, I feel like it's a little unprofessional. Like, mm. when you're ever in a position where you can't get people the files that they need because of space on your end, it just doesn't really look good. Right. So, yeah. I'm not saying spend, a, definitely don't spend a ton of money. Um but it's nice if you have a system that's relatively seamless where you can just say no problem and where also you can leave files up because mm. i also can't tell you how many times you know that's the danger of stuff like we transfer for instance that there's a time limit right you send something mm. to someone and they have a certain number of days and of course it seems ridiculous that they wouldn't just download it when you send it but people sometimes don't yeah and then yeah. it's it's nice to have a link or something that you send to someone that's available for a while. That's funny because yeah. I, I absolutely agree. I, I use uh, Mediafire, and uh, it's it's a bit like WeTransfer stuff like that. Mm. But it's I got the paid account, and I'll sometimes be scrolling through, and I'll see a file from like 2012 that's been downloaded like 25 times. <laughs> like, <laughs> wow! Like, wow! I'm glad I kept that up there because that would have been an email, and then I'd have to dig through my system yeah. to find the file. Blah 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 blah. Yeah. Yeah, that's so a good point. it makes perfect sense to have something that can be up there all the time. Um, yeah. It can save you a huge amount of time. Well, I pay ten bucks a month for um, for Dropbox, and they right. give me at this point in time a terabyte. Yeah, yeah. I think I have the same plan, and it's that's yeah, yeah ten dollars a month is like you know no, that's not yeah, a big for deal VO. For it's it's no, I mean if you're if you're working, then it's not a big deal. Yeah. But yeah. with my Box dot com, I think they only allow me to upload a single file up to two hundred and fifty megabytes. Mm. which is not good. No, that is, because that's Because I could have any number of VOs I might do or longer than that. So Yeah. Yeah. We should be definitely getting a lot of free space based on all this publicity that we're sending right? all these people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if anyone from Mediafire is listening, <laughs> you can up my account storage. <laughs> or Dropbox. Yeah, hello, yeah. Dropbox. Or, <laughs> Dropbox. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I think we've pretty much covered a lot there. Uh, I, yeah. We could have gone into more detail. Um, yeah. And there's lots of Always. stuff that we didn't talk about, but it's a jumping off point. Yeah, it's a jumping off point. And uh, hopefully some of this stuff made sense to to everyone out there listening. I hope so. And I, yeah. and I would just like to um, let people know out there because I get this a lot. Uh, they warn me that they're not a technical person at all. Um, this is not that technical. Mm. It's not that difficult. The problem is 
there is just a constellation of information out there. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, and it's difficult to separate the wheat from the chaff. So get yourself an expert, okay, contact them and make sure it's a trusted source. And then you will get only the information that's required for VO. And by the way, the information that's required to put out a really good VO technically, okay, is really not that great. No. It's it's not a a big deal. Mm. No. It's just not. So if you're thinking, oh, I just can't do this. I can't operate in a DAW. You know, I'm having this problem and that problem. Just stop thinking about that kind of stuff. It's a lot easier than it seems. It's just a matter of getting to the right answers as quickly as you possibly can. And the way that you do that is you hire a trusted pro. Absolutely. And talking to that, how do they contact you guys to uh, to get your golden ears on their audio? Well, I'm uh, info at VOTechGuru.com. Uh, yeah, and Amanda Rose Smith, all one word, at gmail.com. Uh, I'm also on Facebook. I believe it's, if you just search my name, I think I'm the first person who comes up. Uh, Twitter at Lady Soundsmith. Um, I think that's all my things. Oh, you're going to do Twitter too. Okay. Well, I'm Twitter at <laughs> VO Tech Guru <laughs> and I'm uh, on Facebook as VO Tech Guru. Uh, but, but uh, I joke, but uh, I should also mention that I have tutorials uh, for basic stuff, input levels, output levels on YouTube that um, I got a lot of requests for those. So I put those out there. That will help move the ball forward for you pretty quickly if you at least nice. understand those things. And so that's VO Tech Guru on uh, on YouTube. Okay, we've done enough plugging now. Let's... <laughs> 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 All right. Well, Amanda, Tim, thanks so much for joining me. This was a really great chat and so yeah. much information there for everyone out there. Thanks for Thank having us. It was a lot of, lot of fun. Yeah, a lot of fun. Okay, there we go. Episode four, done and dusted. Thank you, Tim and Amanda. And be sure to follow up on their social media and all their many links that they just gave. (laughs) Hopefully that wasn't too much information for you. Um, The good thing about a podcast and something like this is you can just re-listen to it again. Um, Be sure to do what I suggested at the start if any of these subjects uh, confused you. Go ahead and do a bit of research and find out for yourself what we were talking about and then re-listening to the episode with that extra knowledge will reinforce what we're talking about and what you've learnt. so that is that is a way i learned a lot of this stuff um i'd greatly appreciate it if you liked and shared and wrote reviews on itunes and all that stuff uh, because it really helps get the word out about the podcast and that's that will enable us to continue to make these I haven't quite settled exactly on the subject for next episode yet. Uh, I'm torn between two different themes, so I'll let you know. But yeah, I'll be back next week, so keep an eye out for that. All right, stop talking, Jamie. We're done. All right, bye. Thank you to this week's guests, Amanda Rose Smith and Tim Tippett's. Thank you also to our sponsor, J. Michael Collins and Backstage Magazine. Join us next time for another class 